You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Verse 2, Paul asked the question then, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, why is that important to ask? Because that's the only way to get born again, right? The only way to be saved is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they said to him, well, we haven't so much as even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now, that's a problem, right? Now, understand this. In the original text, it literally would read, we have not so much have heard whether the Holy Spirit has been given. And that's important. Oftentimes in our faith, the Holy Spirit gets left out or isn't addressed as much as the Father or Jesus. We are told in the Bible that God is three in one, meaning they're all equal and yet different at the same time. In today's message, Pastor Ron will remind you that many parts of the Lord we won't understand, like the fact that God is one in three at the same time. So when you accept Jesus in your heart, you will also get a filling of the Holy Spirit and He will be with you and in you every moment of every day. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Acts chapter 19 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. All right, now take out your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Acts. And we're studying the book of Acts, and today we're in chapter 19. We're beginning a new chapter today, and boy, has this been a great adventure. And uh, we're going to learn some some more great things again today. So, Acts chapter 19, and let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the word that keeps us on track because we can get off in many directions. Thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit we've been reading about, the birth of the church, the revelation of Christ and all that you've done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now as we learn more of the Holy Spirit today, our our greatest desire is that we have a right balance that we're not listening to what other people say or do, but we want everything your word has for us. So that's what we're asking from instruction today. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. So again, we've entitled our series through the book of Acts, Momentum, because that's really what the book of Acts is all about, the birth of the church and the momentum that carries all through the Holy Spirit. And as I just prayed, that's what we're going to be looking at today. So... uh, Follow along with me. I'm just going to read the first seven verses. This is what we're covering in chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, now came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, well, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when he heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. So here we have quite an interesting passage, and it talks about these men being filled with the Holy Spirit and an interesting situation and all. So what we're going to do, you notice I normally give you a a pointed outline, you know, various points. We don't have that. We're just going to take this as all one flow of thought because it is, and we're going to have a good old-fashioned Bible study is what we're going to do because we need to understand what God is saying here clearly and very importantly in context. Because when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit, there are so many camps and thoughts. Some believe that when you're born again, of course, you receive all of the Holy Spirit. However, though you have all of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not all of them are available to you. On the other hand, there are those who believe that you do receive the Holy Spirit when you're born again, but, you know, there's, those gifts are only available if you have some other event happen in your life. And on and on it goes. It's our endeavor to exegete this passage in the process. Uh, We're going to go through some of the various doctrines that people have come up with. And we want to see what the Bible has to say. So what we want to be is Bereans. Remember in Acts 17, 11, it says the Bereans were more noble in that they received the word of God with all readiness and 
Search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So that's what we're going to do. I've entitled our message, The Work of the Holy Spirit, as we look at what takes place here. And I suppose I would start off with a question, having just read those verses. In order to better understand the passage, we need to ask, what is the spiritual condition of the men that we just read in this passage? These men said they were disciples. Were they saved? I mean, it seems like they are. They say they're believers. So are they? And the other thing is, then are they receiving a, a second work of the Holy Spirit? Or were they unbelievers for the very first time getting saved and therefore they're filled with the Holy Spirit? Th those are good questions to ask. And there's going to be some other questions and so forth we might have as we go through here. But the answer really comes right out of verse 1. So let's jump into it. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Well, let's stop right there. This first part is just connecting us with the last chapter, right? We saw in chapter 18 and verse 23 that Paul has begun his third missionary journey. And again, Paul is doing what he always did. He begins off in Antioch, and then he would retrace all of the places he already established churches. Why? Because Paul was into fulfilling the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not going to all the world to make converts. The Great Commission is going to all the world to make disciples. Now, converts are part of that. That's where it begins. But Paul wasn't into blowing into town, getting some people saved, and then saying, adios, see you later. No, he would disciple them. So he would establish a work, establish a church. And as he went on his first missionary journey, his second, his third, and so forth, he would stop and make sure they're doing okay, checking in with the pastors, making sure they're growing, they're being discipled, as well as start new works as well. So now he's come and he comes to the area of Ephesus and he meets up with these disciples. It says at the end of verse one, and finding some disciples. And it tells us there were 12 of them. Now, who are these men? Now, again, at first you might say, well, they're Christians. It says they're disciples. And many times in the book of Acts and in our Bibles, sometimes that word is used to describe a believer for sure. But as the texts go on, we begin to realize that they're disciples or followers of John the Baptist. That's completely different, first of all. Secondly, just because a person says they're a disciple of Jesus or even a follower, does that mean they're saved? Even in a Bible context. For example, if you remember the story back in Acts chapter 8 when we were there, we saw a man by the name of Simon and he was called a sorcerer. But Philip went there. There was a great revival. He, he seemed to be saved because it says this in Acts 8.13. Now Simon believed and he was water baptized and he continued with the church. Now, those are three pretty big biggies. He believed, he was water baptized and he continued going to church. But after we study the passage further, he wasn't a Christian because then Peter comes into town and he says, you're not saved. He was trying to do this whole gimmick thing to, to use the Holy Spirit for making you know, money again in his sorcery. So Peter says in Acts 8, 21, you don't have part or portion in this matter of Christianity at all. Your heart is not right towards God. You need to repent. So he wasn't saved, though he went through all those things. The same thing could be said of some of Jesus' disciples. And I'm not talking about the 12, although we know that one of the 12 wasn't even saved. But in John chapter 6, right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, now crowds are following him. And he says, I'm the bread of life. I gave you bread and I'm the bread of life. And then he begins to explain what it means to really follow him. And when we get to the end of the chapter, John 6, verse 66, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and followed him no more. That's just to say that just because a person says they're disciples, does that mean they're born again believer? So let's move on. Verse 2. Paul asked the question then, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, why is that important to ask? Because that's the only way to get born again, right? The only way to be saved is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they said to him, well, we haven't so much as even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Well, that's a problem, right? Now, understand this. In the original text, it literally would read, we have not so much heard whether the Holy Spirit has been given. And that's important. 
What do you mean? Well, you might get the idea, if whatever your translation is, that these guys have never heard of the Holy Spirit, but that can't be the case. How do I know that? Well, we know as we read through here, they're disciples of John. And John knew clearly about the Holy Spirit, and John even taught about the Holy Spirit when he baptized people. Let me read it to you. In Matthew 3.11, this is John the Baptist speaking to the crowds. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. And he who's coming after me is mightier than I, speaking of Jesus, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John clearly taught his disciples all about the Holy Spirit. By the way, I've often heard people say, well, you know, I want that fire. He said he's in a baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire. Well, that's not what that fire means in context of what you're thinking. Because he explains what the fire is in the next verse. He'll baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat in the garner. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In context, the fire is speaking of judgment. So when John was preaching, what he was saying is this. When the Holy Spirit comes, he'll testify of Christ. And at that time, you receive Christ, you will receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But if you reject Christ, you will receive the fullness of judgment, fire. Now, the point is this, and I want to come back to this text, is that these men, being followers of John, knew all about the Holy Spirit. So it's not like they didn't know about the Holy Spirit. Their question is really, is, we're not so sure the Holy Spirit has even come. And that's why Paul now asks the next question, verse 3. And it is said to them, and to then what will you baptize? I understand you're disciples of, of, of John. But if you didn't receive the Holy Spirit, obviously, the answer was clear. Yes, so they said, into John's baptism. And this is the key to understanding this passage. These men are disciples of John. In light of that information, again, Paul says this. Then Paul said, okay, I get it. John indeed baptized with the baptism under repentance, right? Remember, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he said to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. Jesus hadn't even come on the scene yet, but he says, the Messiah is coming, Jesus Christ. So Paul affirms the message of, of John. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Messiah is coming. And so as Paul seeks to clarify these men, I want you to see what has happened. He's come to the conclusion, and we should, that these men are not saved. Not saved in a New Testament sense, placing their faith in Jesus Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit. I mean, did the baptism of John redeem a person? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. These men, in the truest sense, are Old Testament believers. Those that were water baptized by John, and certainly these, they had open hearts to God. They were zealous for God. They were looking forward to the coming Messiah. They were looking forward to the pouring of the Holy Spirit. But that, they had not heard of that. They didn't know yet. Now you say, hold on a second. How, how is that possible? I mean, Paul's been going out with the gospel message. Absolutely. But you only have to go far as the last chapter in chapter 18. And we read about Apollos, who came to Ephesus from Alexandria, remember, from Egypt, preaching the gospel of John, the baptism of John. He was a follower or had heard about it, and he was teaching the same thing. So he, like these men, had not heard that Jesus had come, died on the cross, rose from the dead, birthed the church, and the Holy Spirit was given. And so remember in chapter 18, Priscilla and Aquila had to take Apollos aside and tell him, no, Jesus has come. He came, the Messiah came. And now we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So he got saved. So how did people not hear this? Well, because they're, listen, the, the Bible wasn't canonized yet. It wasn't collected. Paul has only begun to go out and preach the gospel in various places. So there's lots of pockets where there's still all the information hasn't gone out. So these men are not saved in what we would say in a New Testament sense because they do not have the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and 9 says, if a man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So Paul proceeds then to preach Christ and the full gospel. And when they heard this, that would have been the full gospel, that Jesus has come, the church is birthed, the Holy Spirit is given. It says they were baptized. How? 
in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, ask yourself, when do you get water baptized? You get water baptized after you receive Christ as your Savior. Is it possible to get baptized before that? Yeah, I was. I was baptized as an infant. I guarantee you, I had no idea what I was doing. I don't even remember it. I wasn't born again. I didn't even know Jesus. How could I possibly? That doesn't save anybody. Water baptism doesn't save anybody anyway. It's a symbol. But you do it after you receive Christ because, in fact, it is a symbol. It looks back at what Christ did in my life. He saved me. I have been crucified with him across. I was buried with him, and I've risen to new life. So think about this. The baptism of John looked forward to the coming of Christ. That's what they had done. But now that they're water baptized, they can now look back. Jesus did this for me, you see. So these spiritual conditions, is these men were saved. So Paul, of course, baptizes them. Verse 6, they, Paul laid hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They were converted men now. Now here's where it gets kind of interesting. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12 in all. Now, as soon as we hit the last part of verse 6, this is, of course, where I want to get us, people jump into one of three camps. There are those who, first of all, say, well, these men are actually, you know, were born again. They were saved already, which I've already clearly from the passage shown they weren't. And now they're receiving a second work, a second touch of God. Now they're receiving, we might, some people would call it even the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But again, from the text, that clearly does not fit. Secondly, there will be those who say, well, these men were born again, and the evidence that they're actually born again is that they speak in tongues. Because you have to speak in tongues to give evidence that you're saved. Thirdly, are those who say, yes, we realize they spoke in tongues here, but that was just for the early church, and those things don't exist anymore. They have ceased. So there's kind of the three major camps. Now we have to ask ourselves, what does the scripture say? That's, that's where I want you to be today, thinking about what does the Bible say? Because we want to come to God's word, and God's word, this is what's so beautiful, what I love about it. God's word has a way of just getting us right to the center, to the core of truth. See, because here's the thing, many times, depending upon how a person was brought up, especially if they were brought up in a, as a Christian, and depending upon what denomination they were raised, many times determines how you interpret a passage. So if you were raised in a Pentecostal, and by the way, we have everything and anything here in our church formally, right? We got people come from Pentecostal background. We got people from Reformed background. We have various evangelicals, all from different walks of life. And you know what? You know why we're all here? We come different? Because this is why we all come here. The Bible has brought us to center where we're going, I just want to be a biblical Christian. I don't need labels, you know. But if you were raised in a Pentecostal church, you look at this and you say, yes, the gifts are for today. And some camps even say, you must speak in tongues in order to be saved. And if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. See, there it is. There's, he laid hands on prayed, and they spoke tongues, but they were saved before, you know. On the other hand, if you were raised in a Reformed church, there's a good chance you're what we would call a cessationist. That means they tried to explain away the Holy Spirit and say, well, no, the gifts are not even for today. We don't even believe. They have ceased. And so the question is, are the Pentecostals right? Or are the evangelical cessationists right? The reform, what's going on? Well, I, there's actually truth in both camps and faults in both camps. Again, every, anytime we start laying our grid over the Bible, we're going to have a problem. So the Bible needs to be placed over everything we do. So let's look at it a little bit more in depth. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9. The book of Acts, just chapter 9, a few pages back. And I want to tackle the Pentecostal side first, if we can. Does this passage teach that at conversion, everyone speaks in tongues, and if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved? Well, let's look at the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, verse 3, he's journeyed from Damascus. Suddenly, a light shines from heaven. Verse 4, he falls down. He hears the voice. Of course, it's Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, he says, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Hey, it's hard for you to kick against the goads, isn't it, Saul? He's trembling. He's astonished. He said, here it is. He's converted. Lord, 
What do you want me to do? The very one he was persecuting and putting people to death. Lord, Lord. He calls him Lord. What do you want me to do? Now rise, go in the city. You'll be told what you must do. Here we have the clear conversion of Paul. Paul refers to this multiple times throughout the New Testament. He's changed man here. But then God speaks to a guy by the name of Ananias, as Paul's in the city, down in verse 17. And he says, I want you to go and see Paul. And Ananias, of course, does it. Down in verse 20, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues. This guy's born again, clearly. Now he's preaching Christ, where before he was killing Christ lovers. So what I want you to see is Paul is saved. Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul is water baptized. But you know what's missing? Paul's not speaking in tongues. He's converted here. He does not speak in tongues. I think that would be very important if that is essential when you get saved. He wrote half the New Testament. So first of all, you can't say it's necessary to be speaking in tongues to be born again. Clearly, Paul wasn't. But what about speaking in tongues? Paul said, yeah, I do that. He writes about it in 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. He did. He goes, I have that gift. But, very important, verse 19. Yet in the church... I would rather speak five words with my understanding. Jesus loves me, this I know, right? That I might teach others rather than 10,000 tongues in an unknown language. Every single believer in the body of Christ, whether they want to use that label or not, is a charismatic. You're a charismatic Christian, you're charismatic. You're, you wanna know why? Because the word charis means gift. And every believer, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, is gifted by the Holy Spirit. You have a gift. God has gifted you. So you are a charismatic Christian. There you go. How about that? You're like, I didn't know that. Wow. Now you got to learn what your gifts are, right? That's a whole different subject. But, but to say that every believer must speak in tongues, can you imagine the damage that's been done over the years? Oh, you don't speak in tongues. You're like a second-rate Christian. Well, I didn't have that gift. Unless you, you know, unless you want the deeper life as a Christian, you've got to speak in tongues. I don't have that gift. Well, how do you know then if someone is really born again? Let me show you how. So let's turn somewhere else. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I've already alluded to chapter 12 a couple times. Chapter 12 is where we have the list of all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, not all of them, but a good list. You know, the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, gift of teaching, gift of administration, all those gifts. So right after talking about the gifts to the Corinthians, Paul jumps into chapter 13. By the way, one of the problems with the Corinthian church is everybody was speaking in tongues, everybody was out of control, and the whole reason the book is written is because they were in the flesh. Paul had to correct them to get it right. So... This is how he begins chapter 13. And you've probably heard this verse before, but now you know the context. Right after talking about all the gifts, he says, though I speak in tongues, I have the gift of tongues, he says, of men and angels, but I don't have love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. If I don't have love, I, I'm just making a bunch of noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy, he talks about that in chapter 12. And understand all the mysteries of knowledge. He talks about the gift of knowledge, the chapter before. And though I all have all faith, that's a gift. He talks about the gift of faith. So that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm zip. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I'm a great philanthropist. And though I give my body to be burned, I'm such a martyr, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. And so the spirit-filled life, or being born again, has nothing to do with the operation of the gifts. How do I know if someone, really, these, that, that guy's really born again. They're really saved. Well, it's what comes out of your life. Not what you do, what comes out of your life. Here it is, Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit. How do we know if someone's... It's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's how I know someone's born again. It's not how high you jump in church. It's how straight you walk and how you love people when you leave here, right? 
You've been listening to Large Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is teaching through the book of Acts, where we're learning what it means to share the gospel and to truly be an evangelist. The word doesn't just apply to Christians or disciples. It is used often to describe anyone who's passionate about something and excited to share their passion with anyone who will listen. Think about a child who just discovered something for the first time. They can't wait to share this information with the world, and they keep sharing it over and over, sometimes even when no one is listening. Well, the disciples just watched their friend die, come back to life, and then ascend into heaven. Jesus had always been something special, but witnessing this series of events must have made them feel like that child. This was amazing, and now they couldn't wait to share it with the world. How will you share your faith with those around you in the days and weeks to come? Thanks for joining us here today on Larger Than Life, a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. We would like to invite you to join us this Sunday. You can do that in person or online. Head over to ltlradio.org for more information. That's ltlradio.org. And don't forget to download our mobile app and subscribe to the Larger Than Life podcast. Thanks again for joining us. That's all for today from Larger Than Life.